<laughs> Even this is pretty good. That's that's what all we've got. We because uh, um my aunt is a Jehovah's Witness, and I haven't like uh, that side of my mom's family. I don't know it. Like I haven't really interacted with her that much. But um, a coworker of mine is uh, a Jehovah's Witness, and like I'm like so they don't celebrate birthdays. They don't do this. They they do this. I'm like what? But then it's like oh yeah, we can buy our stuff. Yeah, that's what. Like, so what? Yeah, you, she could tell you all about it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's do this. Uh, here we are. I think my mic works. Uh, people in the chat, if you can't hear me, let me know. I think everything works. I hope so. Okay, so here we are, Mormons. Uh, this is going to be fun. I can't wait. Uh, or Latter Day Saints. They're really moving away from the Mormon title. Uh, they'll try to call themselves Christians or Latter Day Saints, so they tend not to be. Uh, want to associate themselves with Mormons anymore, and you'll find out why. Anyway, so yeah, week two, and we're going to go over the eternality of God while we talk about Mormons, because it kind of fits with the same theme. So we're going to start with, hello, my name is, anyone see the Book of Mormon, the, the Broadway show? Uh, have listened to it? Okay, well that's the joke, but I haven't seen it, but I've listened to it, uh, it's funny. Anyway, um, the new and improved church, the all-American prophet, kind of go over Joseph Smith and what he claimed. And then big time, what he claimed, we'll be spending most of our time right here. And what do you mean by Saul, like Saul the plates? Testing if he actually was a prophet and just going over what it means when God's eternal, because I'll explain why the Mormons don't believe that. Anyway, so part one, my name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is the big temple down there in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's a more normal Mormon church there, a couple of elders there. So we actually visited this uh, quite recently, as in last Tuesday, they had an open house. So me and my lovely wife, we went down there and there's dumb me just, you know, <laughs> smiling at that grin of I can't wait to go in here. And you're not supposed to bring your camera in there. So this is totally not my picture of the <coughs> baptismal font. OK, you've been claiming that I took this. How, how dare you all? Um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was uh, we'll get to why there's these cows and this and this pool and then kind of um, little unsettling actually, but we'll get to that. So Latter-day Saints, their members not growing, but not shrinking. A lot of people are leaving, but a conversion rate is not good. So they kind of are evening out. Not the only way they would grow is by children, but they still are uh, not losing members, but not gaining. So they're just kind of staying right, right where they are. The required text for the Mormon is going to be the Bible, asterisk, if, in and so far it's translated correctly. So if you have a verse that disagrees with their documents or their doctrine, it's the Bible's fault, not their fault. So the Bible must be translated incorrectly. Nice. Yes, uh, there is a Joseph Smith translation. They don't use that a lot because there is a big problem with uh, how did he translate that? He didn't know Hebrew, he didn't know Greek. Where is he getting all these manuscripts from? And it is a disastrous translation. It adds all this kind of stuff. He even adds a prophecy about himself. Uh, in the last book of Genesis. So that's nice. It's like you make a prophecy about your birth. Like, look, it came true. Like, dude, you're Lord. What? So that's him. Um, book of Mormon, big for them. The Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. And we'll be going over all those. Who is Jesus then? Uh, he's a God. He's not the God. He's not the eternal God. He's not all God Almighty. He's just a God. One of a plethora of gods and millions and millions, a pantheon of gods. He was the first son of Elohim. And uh, this is all part of their doctrine, so. <laughs> uh, and he uh, had as a brother, his brother was Satan. Not kidding, Lucifer was his brother. And his father, Elohim, because they think Jehovah is Jesus, Elohim is the father. Uh, he was once a man, like we were, and then he exalted himself to godhood. Uh, and he had a god, and then his god had a god, and then his god had a god. All the way back from eternity, that's what they believe. So our god today, and Jesus, was once a man, complete man is flesh and bone and then was so good through following the laws and the ordinances that he achieved godhood uh, erotic that is. yeah um so we'll be going over over that oh, yeah he wants man like us became a god and brother satan um required works you got to obey all god's commands living a very righteous life they try not to sin at all some will even claim they don't sin like they'll go days without sinning uh constant study and following the church's rules constant church rules uh, common P's and D's, you know, practices and beliefs, like you'll see many of these groups kind of having the same ones. Uh, all churches are pagan, 
the end of the world is soon. Not like any day, but it's like it's it's here. It's it's an end. Latter day saints. Like we're in the latter day, guys. Uh, shunning is used very very much so. If you're in Utah and you stop being a Mormon, good luck finding a job. That uh, that is very rough for people who are excommunicated from the church in that state to uh, to survive. Most of them will leave because other Mormons will just reject them, kick them out, and say we don't know you. You're dead to us. Uh, you're gonna go to hell. And uh, yeah. Disagreement with church leaders is forbidden. You need to obey the church 100%. So the new and approved church. So Latter-day Saints, kind of a general what they believe. Through, again, through many works, you can receive exaltation, become a god of your own planet. All faiths lead to heaven except ex-Mormons. So Muslim, he's going to go to heaven. Because they believe in three different levels. They believe in the celestial, the telestial, the <laughs> celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdoms. And there's different levels, and each one has different levels of joy. But Joseph Smith is quoted, or one of the presidents would say, even Hitler, if he gets to the lowest level of heaven, like would be just, he would just be in so much joy. Or if you were to, if you knew how good the lowest level was, you'd just kill yourself right now just to get there. So it's very much a, you know, like all, all, all faiths are going to lead there into this except great, ex amazing thing. Uh, except ex-Mormons, though. They're going to go to outer darkness. There, there's no hope for them whatsoever. So as long as you believe something. Shnikes. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, ten main branches of Mormons, which are not in unity. So it's not like us, like, hey, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, you know, all are going to heaven as long as they have that relationship with Christ. Um, Mormons don't believe that. Yes, I figured, I realized that when I was watching Sister Wives. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's the fundamentalist church. That's an off-branch of, of um, Brigham Young and his... Uh, I'll give you more history on, the, on how they broke. Okay, actually, I'll give it right now. Uh, so when Joseph Smith died, he didn't actually he didn't have a successor. You would think that he's the new prophet and he's going to bring about this new church, yet he doesn't have any rules for succession. That seems a little weird. So anyway, when he died, he they kind of had a fight. It was uh, Sidney Rigdon, James Strange, uh, Brigham Young, and then Joseph Smith the third, which was his son. His son was like ten years old at the time, so they didn't really follow after him. But each one broke off into their own. You had James Strang Group, which is actually still called the Church of Latter-day Saints. Brigham's, which is the Church of Latter-day Saints. Other ones is like Church of Christ, Reformed Church of Christ, uh, Fundamentalist um, uh, Church of Christ or Latter-day Saints. So there's quite a bit, but they all disagree with each other. They all think they're the true church. Now the LDS is what we're going over, and they all kind of believe the same stuff pretty much, but uh, they think they're the only ones because they have the most members. Like, well, that's how you're judging it? Like, where is that in the Bible? Like, isn't it the narrow road? But that's a whole other conversation. So that's how they say we're right because we have the most members. Um, excuse me. I've already been over several, le several levels of heaven and salvation, obviously, through godly life, baptisms, and then laying on of hands. That's a new thing. Uh, current president is Russell Nelson. I think he's in his late 90s now. And he says he speaks directly to God, like audibly. Yeah. Uh, and I know he's a liar because that's not true. Uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet and all the churches are abominations, but they hold to. Uh, God was once a man and, you know, and is a man today. He's not a spirit today. He is a man making spirit children with his goddess wife in heaven. We were all once spirits in heaven, according to them. And then we came down here to make a choice, be tested, whatever. And then we will be, you know, back up to heaven we go. Don't so. you love it when you get sucked in by an ISIS and then you... When you're in and you can't escape, they start telling you all these heretical teachings. It's um, it gets deeper. So yeah, we're gonna keep going. Um, yeah, everyone pre-exists in heaven, and of course, you must abstain from alcohol, coffee, and tea. Now, I'll give them that one. Like, yes. I don't abstain from alcohol, but coffee, it's like, like I had to stink, stop drinking coffee recently because of you know issues, and it's like, wait, did I? I've been drinking the same cup for ten years. Like, was it maybe I shouldn't have been doing this? I'm relying on something, and so. Just putting it out there that maybe they have something on coffee, but not soda. They have soda shops everywhere in Utah. You, they, I mean, that's nothing that exists here, right? But they have pop shops of where you go to get soda. Are like, these caffeinated drinks? Or? Oh, yes. Very much so caffeinated. Right. You'd think, like, but wait a minute. Is this for caffeine? No, because it's a verse that Joseph Smith said about hot drinks. But they're also loose on the hot drink thing, too. So it's really they've just said, hey, no tea, no coffee. Yeah. No alcohol. They've just kind of landed there as a no, no absolutely not. Okay. Saves a lot of money on a uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, see people commenting. Thank you for the comments. We'll read them after because I'm doing this. Um, but thank you. 
So this is the, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. This is their two big ones. They will study this way more than the Bible. Like, the Bible is just an afterthought to them. Um, the All-American Prophet. Here we go. There he is, our boy, Joseph Hi. Smith, Jr., right there. Uh, I don't know if he actually looked like that or not. That's a, Someone asked me that recently. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but this is what Joseph Smith said. I have more to boast than any man has had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep the whole church together since the days of Adam, and a large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. Joseph Smith, History of the Church. Wow, that's So he is dense. boasting that he did more than Jesus himself. So just kind of getting into the mind of who we're dealing with here. An extreme narcissist. Uh, he was born in December 23rd, 1805. Claimed divine revelation when God the Father. It's important because it's how we really pick apart scripture and see what's been claimed here. God the Father and Jesus appeared to him. Claimed an angel revealed golden plates which contained the Book of Mormon. And he was killed by a mob in 1844. Apparently he shot back. So not much of a martyr if you're shooting back at the people. But I can't confirm that. But that's apparently, that's a whole other thing. He did have 40 wives. 11 already had husbands, 7 were under 18 years old, and 2 were 14 years old. Uh, if you're ever going to argue with Mormon, don't bring this up. They already know this. Um, they, some are like, very, well, it's kind of gross, but whatever. Others will try to defend it. Uh, but some don't know. Some have no idea that's true. But it is a, absolutely a fact. Um, he believed in dowsing rods, divine rods, and glass looking. Absolutely did. And he was arrested for fraud. And here is his arrest record, a misdemeanor. Here it is, Joseph Smith, for glass looking or being essentially a, a fraudster, a scammer. And uh, he, he was placed on bail, fled the bail, and then came back after the statute of limitations was up and said, hey, it's too late now, you can't get me. So he never actually wow. served any time or paid any fine for this. Uh, but this is absolutely a fact. The majority of people have no idea this exists. Uh, well, Mormons don't know that exists. So, uh, is the Bible a trilogy? Is the Book of Mormon really a thing? This is what the president said. He said, either right or wrong, true or false, fraudulent or true, and that's exactly where we stand with a conviction in our hearts that it is true, that Joseph went uh, into the grove, that he saw the Father and the Son, and he talked with them, and that Moroni came, and the Book of Mormon was translated from those plates, that the priesthood was restored by those who held it uh, ancestrally and... Uh, what's it? Anciently, I can't read from this way. I'm sorry. Uh, then that's that's our claim. That's where we stand, and that's where we fall if we fall. Yes, everything they believe falls on this. Now we as Christians hold that well, everything falls on resurrection of Christ. For Mormons, it's very much on Joseph Smith. Is are these things true? Well, if they are true, I'll become a Mormon. If they're not true, I should do a class teaching how Mormonism isn't right uh, and put it on you know on my TV and you know that whole thing. Anyway. Uh, I claim, therefore I am, Joseph Smith and his claims. So he said he received special revelation from God and angels. Let's test that. So in 1820, yeah, he, he, he received these claims, which make him 14 years old. He saw the Father and Jesus. And they said to him, oh, this is what he said in the Pearl of Great Price. If no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound, when a light rested upon me and I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defined all description, standing above me in the air, one of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, uh, This is my beloved son, hear him. Okay? So the Father and Jesus, two personages. Problem is, 1 Timothy 6.16, written 2,000, well, okay, 1,800 years before Joseph had this revelation, says, Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see? Talking about the Father. So if it's not possible to look at the father, how is Joseph looking at the father? The father, and I get, get a little thing about the Trinity, the father exists outside of space and time. Jesus is God who enters into space and time. He is the words, how God communicates with his creation. That's the whole point of how he reaches in. So why would the father now leave beyond space and time, because he has to be, be able by logic and how you create the universe, why is he now entering into it when that's not what he does in the first place? Like, why is this? Is, this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Like, you can't see him. It's impossible. He's beyond your reach. Yet he's appearing before Joseph. And wouldn't the Mormons simply say, though, that that's just a mistranslation? Though? They would say no. They would actually agree with this. And they say, well, Joseph was just that divine. 
They would say he was just that holy where he could actually see him. Oh, uh, so Moses, who, you know. Uh, believe me, yes. Yeah, like if Moses could, like if he actually, if the God was like, basically, if you see me, you're going to die. Yes. Oh, I know. They just it, it up. But so... that's, that's how high, you hit a good point, because that's how high they held, held him. As like he he can he was so pure and so great that he could look upon the father himself and not die. It's like, wh what? Like yeah. And now we're just contradicting scripture. Um, they sing songs to him. That they they have no joke. This guy is pretty much worship. They'll say they don't worship him, but it, it's pretty obvious they do. Uh, then I asked the person that you stood above me in the light, which of all these sects was right? Like which should I join? Which which church should I join? I was answered that I must join none of them, for they all were wrong. And the person that you addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt. So every single church out there is an abomination. They're all corrupt. So, well, thanks, Joseph. Well, who should we join? Well, you should join me, of course. Of course, that's not what Scripture says. Uh, I also that you say to you, Peter, upon this rock, Christ being the rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. So I'm going to plant it and it's never going to be overcome. And another great verse I like is 1 John 2, 8 says, I'm writing to you, which is true in him and you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So I have planted my church. Darkness is moving away. Light is coming in. The light's not going to be snuffed out. I'm letting weeds and wheat grow together. I'm planting the mustard seed, which is going to overpower them all. The church is not going to disappear. It's not going to be destroyed. There is not a great apostasy. It's the same church that has been from the beginning all the way here. I, Christ, am the cornerstone. I am sovereign. I'm not going to let what I died for crumble. It's going to stay. All cults have to do this. Because if you can't if you can't get rid of the church, it's like, well, why are you here? What are you restoring? Yeah, something has to be destroyed in order to do that. The problem is scripture and history says that is not the case. That never happened. There was never a great apostasy. Anyway, um, so this is his, now the angel Moroni has appeared. Um, Moroni was the son, apparently, according to, to Joseph Smith, the son of Mormon, who was of the tribe of Nephi. And then he becomes an angel. Yeah, this is, yeah, of the American Jews who, because again, just getting into their history, they believe that a tribe of Jews was sailed over to the United States in submarines. I'm not kidding. This is what they believe. And they were placed here. And then Jesus came here after he had ascended into heaven, went over to America, and then came down and started witnessing to people in the Americas. Now, there's obviously no history for that. Uh, and anyway, he gives us this whole thing about the tribes being there, what they did, these battles. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the history, but there's never been any history found on that or any archaeology. It's all just ma Joseph made it up. But you, he, this is these the Moroni apparently is from one of these tribes. He wrote these plates. He was a prophet. That's where he's getting this. This is just who Moroni is supposed to be. Anyway, he called him by name and said unto me, he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me that his name was Moroni. He said that there was a book deposited written upon gold plates, giving an account, remember the gold plates, giving an account to the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, and it must be delivered the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Okay, that's the big one there. The fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained within it. Okay, this is what, sec this is all in the Book of Mormon. Second Nephi, Moroni, we know that is by grace that we have been saved after all we can do. And again, Moroni, if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then his grace is sufficient for you. So it's not you're saved by grace and that of response you love God. No, this is once you do enough works, then you'll get it. Salvation comes to the individual only through obedience not through faith in christ through obedience so this is the new this is the gospel that he is being you know, preached that and he said of course ephesians by paul not a result of works yet joseph saying it's a result of works so by which gospel should we believe it and my favorite verse for mormons yeah, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you let him be, in the Greek says anathema, which means eternally condemned. So here we go. Nephi is saying, you'll save by grace after all the stuff you can do. You better work for it. It's not sufficient if you don't do certain things. Yet what does scripture say? It's not a result of work. 
works. It is strictly by faith and by faith alone that you are saved. No man can boast in this. You have done nothing to deserve it. So one of these is the true gospel, one of them's not. What is the typical Mormon response to this verse? Uh, it's going to be the typical one of most cults or most false faiths when they get into it. They're going to say, well, it's like opening a present. You have to work to get the wrapping paper off, and then you get the gift, and there you go. It's like, that's not, that's still, that's not work. Okay, one thing to unwrap something, it's another thing to work 30 years of your life or something. Like, this is not, this, this is a terrible analogy. Okay. So they're going to get around in those terms of like, well, you should work for something if you appreciate it. It's the typical, I have to, you know, work for salvation kind of thing. Uh, but again, most don't even know this verse because they don't read their Bibles. Solution to all this is just, please read your Bible. Um, yes, let them be. So Paul's serious with, with this. Like, if they, even an angel, which Moroni apparently is an angel, eternally condemned. So special revelation for God does not equate with scripture, and it's just his claims that he, it's not like it doesn't anyone else witness this. So we're going to take his word for it, and we're going to take God's that he's established in his word. This cannot be possible, and Joseph's saying, well, I say it is. That doesn't work. So apparently he found gold plates, and these were seen by others. So this is going to be good. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is him digging up the plates out in his backyard, and he ran three miles distance, put them under his arm, jumping over a log. Then a man sprang up and struck him with a heavy uh, blow with a gun, and then he ran another half mile, and then more people came. He was accosted three times. He said, this is all in the Joseph Smith papers. This is church documentation of how he got the plates and all the struggle he faced with doing this. So this is no joke, right? I dug them up, ran three miles, put them under my arm, jumped over logs. Three people tried to attack me. One hit me with a gun. I was limping, but I, man, I, I got back. I'm so awesome. Um, and just reminding everyone, Maru and I spoke of gold plates because they were gold. Looking inside, just saw gold plates, seer stones, breastplate. These are, this is a, this is gold, okay? Um, and then letter from Lucy saying that they support, according to Joseph, were made of pure gold. Okay, all right, that's his words for it. And again, the what, all, all church stuff, the Wentworth letter says that the church, the church, the plates dimensions were six inches by eight by six. Okay, now for that, I need a volunteer, just one volunteer, who, who wants to, wants to volunteer? Oh, uh, you, you picking it up? <laughs> no, hey, seriously, come here. here. Sarah, I got something for you, okay? I know people online can't hear me, but that's okay. What I have is two bricks, okay? Just sitting right on the carpet there, okay? Now, you were, how old are you? 15. 15, okay. Joseph apparently was like 22, 23 when he did this, okay? So, that's all right. You're, you're a big, you know, 15-year-old. So, what you're going to do, you can put these underneath your arm, right like that, and, okay? Now, when I say go... You're going to run three miles, jump over some logs. I've got some woods in the back. And then I've hired three men to try to kill you. Uh, one <laughs> and if you get three miles before they get those, um, you win. And you win two terrible, like, moss-covered bricks. Okay? Do you think that's possible? You sure? Yeah, it's quite heavy, aren't they? How much do you think that weighs? Um, Okay, so it's 25, so close, yeah, it's 25, yeah, it's not, it's no joke, I was like winded just coming in from the house, and apparently Joseph said, said that he did this, now this, 25 pounds, maybe, I mean, if you're in shape, right, I, I can see possibly doing that, 25 pounds, it's no joke though, arm. under your arm, so running three you miles, how many books there were, or how many plates there were, uh, just one solid brick, I'll, sh I'll show you now on the next slide so here, I mean, we, can, we can calculate the density and the, Oh, yes, and it has been done. So, okay. you, yeah, you're ahead of me right there. I like it. Yeah, so this is apparent, according to the church, this is what the plates look like. Um, they're, they're very serious with this. This is all their artwork here. Uh, now, this is a lead replica of the plates. Anyone want to take any guess how much that weighs? It is 118 pounds. Okay, so that's. 50 kilograms is what I meant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 118. No joke, right? This is in a bookstore uh, in Utah. It's, it's a, in a Christian bookstore. Do not turn sacred pages. Yes. Um, so lead is 41. Uh, you know, 41. Yes. Point four one pounds. Excuse me. Yes. Per cubic inch. Per cubic inch is lead. Anyone want to take a guess how much gold is cubic inch? I'm assuming it's higher than. Less, more? Anyone want to take a guess? Any guesses? 
It's less than a pound. Less okay, less than a pound per cubic inch. I'll give you that. It is 0.7. So almost double what lead is. Gold, pure gold especially, weighs quite a bit. But Joseph had no idea how much real gold weighed because Joseph was a poor man. I'm not like, insulting him because he was poor. Everyone was poor back then. But you know, handling pure, actual gold, yeah, gold weighs a lot. The gold replica of this would weigh 201 pounds. So a two, that was 25, right? That's 25. <laughs> so um, the excuse for this is, well, he was a farmer. He was a big boy. Like, this is not some Icelandic bodybuilder. Like, you could not take something 200 pounds, put it under your arm, run three miles, fight off three people, jump over logs. Absolutely not. This is what everything that he said. And he's just holding them simply here. He would not, I've lifted up an anvil once when I used to work at a museum. An anvil. Those things weigh like about 200 pounds. I, maybe an inch. Maybe. I'm just, <laughs> it goes out, you know, like, and I was, you know, in my early 20s. He's just holding it like a, that's, that's nothing. That would have not been possible. That's, anyone try to, to I mean, what, what's, I, I'm not, I can't curl 50 pounds. And I, I struggle when I try to get one, you know, those 50 pounders you get at the gym. And that's four times that. It just looks gold. Gold plated. Well, no, no. It's <laughs> pure gold. Like, it's not even gold plated. They are plates made of gold. Now, the church's response to this, um, yeah, well, it's wrong, is to say, well, it's part gold. Yeah. Like, it's, you know, has some tin in it. It has some bronze. But they've got the weight down. These They've hired chemists to do this whole thing to say, Oh, what it was really made of? They've got the weight down to 120 pounds. So it's okay. not gold. So, okay, now it's not gold. Now it's not pure gold. It's still a lot. It's <laughs> exactly like 120 pounds is still no joke. Like it's not it's not feasible to say you actually did this. So what it puts this in such a quandary because either they weren't made of gold and they weren't what you gave a terrible description of what they were, which means you were lying, or you didn't actually find them, or you did find them, they're real, and you didn't really run three miles, you didn't fight off three people, you didn't really do all this, and therefore you're lying about that. So either way, you're lying. Something, the truth is not coming here, and it's all him. It's not anyone else saying this. It's saying, I found these plates, I ran, I did this, these were gold. So unfortunately, he was, hey, he's a smart guy, I'm not going to take that from him, but not smart enough to know how much gold weighed. Yeah, and then he translated these plates into the Book of Mormon. Uh, here he is. This is all over their church. By the way, I saw this at the, um, the, the temple. It was on like a piece of paper. Yeah, so it wasn't one of the, one of the big paintings, but yeah. Anyway, so here's him. I could have sworn I saw this in one of the rooms, but I can't be sure. But anyway, because we were... Anyway, um, these are pictures, but it's more like this. Now, this is official church stuff, too. They'll have this all over there. Everything is, is filled with this guy right here. More accurately, this is how he translated it. You're saying, looking into a hat? Yes. And here we go. Joseph Smith. This is uh, David Whitmer, one of the uh, witnesses. We'll get into that. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. It was a, basically a river stone that he found at the bottom of a well. It's a whole thing. And he put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light into the darkness. The spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling a parchment would appear. And on that appeared writing, one character at a time would appear under it. And on the interpretation in English, Brother Joseph would read it off in English to Oliver Cowdery, uh, who was his principal scribe. And it went on writing down and repeated to Brother Joseph, see if it was correct. And he would disappear and another character would, with the interpretation, would appear. Okay, so he's sticking his face in a hat with a stone down there, and out of that would light up characters. This is what he's saying is happening. So this is not true. It was that. This is how he translated. Yeah, good question. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is, if he was translating it with a rock and a hat and was just seeing things happen, why did he even need the plates? <laughs> Yay. So in fact, not to get too far than this, because I could talk about this for another hour, there's most Evans saying he was never in the same room with the plates when he was translating it. So it's like, well, like someone had to listen. So two people are away from the plates. So this idea that it was, let me go back here, this, he was never translating it like this. He even admitted that I put my head in the hat. That's how the whole thing happened. Now, the head in the hat thing is folklore or folk, um, 
magic that was around the area. It was like this divining thing where you would put objects, like if someone lost their wristwatch, you would put little pieces of them into the hat and you would like see images of where it might be. That was very popular in this area at this time. Uh, and glass looking was essentially the exact same thing. You would find a seer stone or something, put your face in a hat to try to dull out the light, and then it would reveal buried treasure or all kinds of other stuff. Well, no drugs back then, but there was good money in folklore. What, what would have been the motivation to create that sort of... Like, he could have simply said, oh, I translated the plates, so I had divine inspiration, and therefore translated the plates. What, what, would be the, what would be the motivation to construct the remainder of, you know, I'd put my head in a hat and stuff like that? Why, I, why I think, personally, culture, because it was so popular back then among this, this folk idea of uh, folk magic and whatnot. Um, the, the, the divining rods and the let me find you buried treasure with seer stones that was very popular back in, in that time in the but it 1800s. Might have not have been popular with the Christians at the time. No, it wasn't. Um, not at all. <laughs> Many Christians outed him and said like this is this is not cool at all. Now he grew up because in in that time, like re main reading material was the Bible because that's I mean that's that's part of the culture of the United States. So he's familiar with the scriptures and, and knew what and probably went to church. I'm no doubt, but it's he went and took it a completely different way. Uh, not to saying that some of that folk magic didn't like weave its way into some like Christian circles, possibly, but this was people that really wanted to see something cool that were big into it's like the Illuminati today. Like, oh, I'm big into that. It's got to be a secret thing. And that's how a lot of cults gain traction is because of that secret knowledge, that really cool thing. Like, wow, this is really true. SCP uh, is real. It's, not, <laughs> it's real. It's so, protect. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I think that's more of his motivation because it was, it was just something enchanting and amazing, and he was kind of used to doing this scam already. So he just, he just kept on going with it. Um, so, no. Uh, and just to hit on this where he says, uh, if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character would, in, would appear above it. So you would think he'd get it right the first time. Um, he didn't. And there have been over 4,000 revisions to the Book of Mormon so far. Now, they say, oh, they're just... Cor little tiny corrections here and there. It's like, well, it should have been 100% the first time. If, if this is magic stones talking to you, why now is it, it is not working anymore? Like, should have not have disappeared? So it doesn't really help their case that it's been, it keeps having to be updated because there's some serious flaws. And the main flaws of why they're doing it is because you find plot holes within a story. Like, wait, that was the wrong guy. Like, no, no, oh, crap. You erase, put it back in, like, Oopsie, that, that was, I guess that character died in Act 2. Okay, so I cast a, yeah, I have to rewrite that. That's where most of these revisions are coming from because it's almost like he made up the story or something. Weird. That, that's a double. Sorry. Um, it's kind of like turning off their brains from critically thought. Yeah, that's a lot of these. Is, um, but, you know, it's, uh, to, to quote Dr. Martin, Dr. Uh, Walter Martin, you can have somebody who is a great you know, thinker as far as wisdom and and just intelligence, book smarts, but that does not equate to spiritual blindness. Like those, you can just believe something that's totally whack and yet be one of the smartest men on the earth. Like it has nothing to do with intelligence. You can just, you can want to believe something and trick your brain into buying all kinds of stuff. That is um, true. And it, it's really just turning it off and saying, I only want to look at the evidence. I don't, I don't even want to try. It's like, no, you force yourself to look at the evidence, to be f truthful with this and use it as you would anything else. Um, so no, I don't think he translated uh, from the plates. And now, one of my favorites, translating the Book of Abraham. This is part of the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, this is probably the one who's damning things for the church. And I have to bring it up because it's so good. Uh, this is in the Book of Abraham. If I had a copy of the Pearl of Great Price, you would see this exact page. I don't because I don't want to give the Mormon church a penny. But I just, you know, just downloaded this. Thank you. Anyway, this is, they say, so in 19... 66. So this, okay, I'll give them one more history. Back in the 1840s, the Mormons were leaving New England area. They were moving on out into to find their promised land. And they came across a guy who was buying funeral, uh, not, um, Egyptian hieroglyphs and stuff. Because grave robbing back in the 1800s in Egypt was very popular. And they're selling all kinds of stuff that uh, archaeologists would probably be tossing right now. Like, you did what to this? Hi, buddy. Yes, I know. Go back in the room. Anyway, um... So the, they found a wandering salesman that was selling the stuff, and they went, well, it's hieroglyphics. Like, this must be a sign from God. So they got all their money together, bought this piece, and Joseph Smith began translating off this, and he said that this was written by Abraham himself 
back in 2000 BC when he was in Egypt. Abraham did go to Egypt, okay? And with it is all the stuff, and of course, Mormons are gonna be in there, like this is a, you know, about what Abraham's doing and how it's gonna, this whole thing is gonna shake out, really cool stuff. Wow, Joseph, you're totally right. You have proven yourself to be a translator. Anyway, they thought they lost it, and here's, you know, here's Joseph's writing, and here's the actual papyri. They found the papyri in the New York uh, Metropolitan, um, that place, um, uh, Museum of Art, that's the word I'm searching for, and they found it. They thought it was burned, they were wrong, and they were like, yay, we got our papyrus back. So the Mormon church went crazy, and they were like, yes, we're going to get Egypt Egyptologists to look at the whole papyri, because they had seen this before, and they said, I don't think this is correct. They said, well, no, 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 you didn't see the whole thing because this is the whole thing, right? And they said, well, you only have this piece, so you're just, you're, just, you're just wrong. And there's another piece to it too, but it's like, okay, well, that's all you have. Anyway, so these three guys here, they looked over the entire papyri just to clarify and to confirm what Joseph had gone by, and they found out that this was not the Book of Abraham. It was not written by Abraham, and it's called the Book of Breathing. It's a funerary text for Horus, and it was written about 50 BC not even close to anything. In fact, they said not only did Joseph Smith not translate anything, not one thing was even correct. Like even if you were to randomly, accidentally get something right, so you didn't even do that. Like none of it is correct. Now the church said they were gonna publish their findings once the Egyptologist did it. They didn't, obviously, because this is like, hey, you found out the guy was, he might've been really like, hey, go get you, but it is definitely not true. And the church had mud on its face, and it is still trying to recover from this, like, big time. They, they've had their ways to say, like, oh, it's a copy, or, oh, well, it, it's actually not the full thing. Like, it doesn't matter. It's so, I mean, 100%, if I just go back and say, like, how is this? Like, oh, he didn't really copy from that. Like, really? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, sure he did. Like, this is it. This is, you, you guys are dead in the water on this. Uh, confirms Joseph did not translate it. There's even some bizarre ones where they'll say, well, it's not a translation. What this, this might mean this in, in hieroglyphics, but it actually means five different sentences in Hebrew or in English. Like, what? Like, yeah, it might have the word D. D actually means uh, divinely God was saying to Abraham. Like, what? That doesn't, that's not how translation works. See, there's translation and then there's translation. This, oh, it's, it's, you have to pull out paragraphs by one letter. I'm not kidding. That's actually some of the justification for this. Um, that's when you really got a book of breathing. Yeah, the, it's called a book or a, um, a book of the dead is actually another way of saying it. Yeah, funerary text. It's meant for, yeah, burying people. So no, uh, I don't think he translated the book of Abraham. That pretty much damns him as absolutely wrong. Yeah, I wanted to put sound effects in here. It just doesn't work with Google Slides. All right, and uh, any questions before we jump into that? That was the main part of it, so we'll kind of burn through the rest of it. Yeah, what do you got? So, so far? was there any evidence of this that it's actually existing? No. Um, we're going to get into, apparently there's witnesses to the plates. That will be um, right here, actually. So I'm actually your question perfectly with this. Um, so in the, oh, I left my iPad in there. I had done my iPad. If we go to the Book of Mormon, I have it on PDF after the third or fourth page, you're going to see this, the testimony of the witnesses, the three and then the eight. And this is all about how they saw the plates, how they held them, how they looked at them, confirming that Joseph Smith actually had plates. And you read this and you go, oh, snap, like these people saw the plates, like they must exist. Cool. But did they really? Well, um, and just look, this is what the Book of Mormon says. In addition, Joseph Smith, the Lord provided for 11 others to see the gold plates for themselves and to be special witnesses of the truth and divinity of the Book of Mormon. Their writing testimonies are included here within the testimony of the three and the eight. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna skip over that. It's the same thing, like we saw them, we saw the plates, we held them aloft, um, they're made of gold, whatever have you, and here's everyone that signed it, Christian Whitner, Jacob Whitner, Paul. We're gonna go over each one of these people. So, testimony of the three and then the eight. Now, anyone kind of pick out some, because Joseph Smith Jr. was our, was our boy here, you see any similarities here? Whitmer, right? Whitmer, Whitmer, Smith, Smith, Smith. Hey, Dad. <laughs> hey. There is a bit of a, wait, are you just like from two different families? Well, yeah, pretty much. Um, if if not brothers, it's like, hey, father-in-law, brother-in-law, things like cousin, like things like that. Yeah. So this is his direct family. Of oh, there's, there's his dad right there. 
and the rest of these, I think Samuel's a, a brother, uh, brother-in-law, but I, um, or not brother-in-law, uh, anyway, that was uh, the Whitmer stuff. So yeah, um, except for Paige, and Paige was, real, I can't get what, exactly what it is, he was related to one of them somehow. Um, except for Martin Harris, that was one of his friends, and same thing with Calvary. Anyway, yeah, these are, here are eight witnesses. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do this. So let's start uh, with the family here. I'm going to just cut them out and say that these are actually oh, like, God. yeah, your family says that you saw them. Like, um, if this was a scam and you're going to use them in court, your family is not a good witness to these things actually existing. Sorry, like, that's uh, not happening. <laughs> So we're going to look at John Whitmer and Herm Page, see what they had to say. Now, again, they had signed this, even though it's in Joseph Smith's handwriting. Anyway, um, with only a veiled reference to what I saw, Page does not say he saw the plates, but that angels confirmed it in his faith. What? Confirmed it. This is, by the way, this is Mormon stuff. This is all their stuff here. I'm not, I didn't pull this from some other obscure source. This is their documentation. Um... He says, uh, Whitmer says, were shown to me by a supernatural power. I didn't actually look at them. They were actually supernatural power. Second sight. So we've cut them out. Well, how about Christian Whitmer and, and Peter Whitmer? Um, they actually died. They died like two, three years, four or five years after the plates. So unfortunately, they can claim it, but we can't test them. Uh, unfortunately, they're not. It's like we're going to bring this to a stand. It's like, where are your other witnesses? Oh, they're dead. Okay, well, can't exactly use them. Uh, David Whitner. Let's go let's go over him. One of the three main witnesses. If you believe my testimony to the Book of Mormon, if you believe that God spake to us three witnesses by his own voice, then I tell you that in June 1838, God spake to me again by his own voice from the heavens and told me to separate myself among the Latter-day Saints. So he is completely saying, no, I. this is, God is saying, no, like, if you believe that, then believe me with this. God says this is a bunch of this is a bunch of bunk. Like, no, this did not happen. God told me to get away from them. If you actually saw plates and believed Joseph the prophet, why would God? You agree that God's telling you to get out? Like, you are completely the opposite of that. You're saying no. A lot of this is not even true. So yeah, separate myself from among them. By the way, everyone I'm listening got kicked out of the church. Like, there were no people except for like one or two that actually died members. Joseph Smith sent letters saying these people are demons, they're evil. Like, these are the witnesses that sold the plates. And even Joseph is saying, like, don't even trust these guys. Anyway, so that's David Whitmer. He's out. Let's look at Martin Harris. He's my favorite one. Uh, Stephen Burnett, in a letter written in 1838, a few weeks after the event, described Martin Harris' testimony to this effect. When I came to hear Martin Harris state in public that he never saw the plates with his natural eyes only in vision, or in imagination. So I just basically saw them in like, you know, I closed my eyes and, and imagined them. Yeah. So I never actually physically saw them. I just spiritually saw them. Or hallucinating. Or hallucinating or whatever, yeah. What's Did that? Did you say there also, neither Oliver nor David? Neither them. Oliver nor David, right. So all three of us didn't see them. Yes, yeah. We had it in our mind. <laughs> we thought about There was a it. thing called Second Sight back then, which basically said, if you really like focus on something and say like this is true and like believe it in your head then it's true like this is the idea of like imagining things so it's like like because like, i think i don't know if me and you watched it like it was a, a documentary on the beginning of new age and you thought oh sorry it's pretty yeah. interesting like you're fine you're good um here's another one it says uh yeah the eyes of faith or spiritual eyes so not even with real eyes eyes of faith i just believe it's there so therefore it's so there. what did so 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 okay so they didn't see them with their eyes no they saw them with their spiritual Jesus eyes, the eyes. Is, so in other words i closed my eyes and imagined they were there vision. at one point they asked joseph if they could see the plates joseph took them miles away and said that they needed to pray to god to see the plates and, ima and close their eyes and imagine what they look like it's like wait a minute why don't you just Okay, oh, they're over here at the blanket. Here you go. Like, why not do that? No, he needed to take them out. Um, again, saw them with spiritual eyes. Should have done that with the, the bricks. There. I should These have. These are really gold. These are really good. Yeah, I should have done that. Yeah, yeah that's, you. yeah. Um, also, Martin Harris changed his religion 13 times. Mm -hmm. So he was a part of the Mormons, left, became Christian, part of the Mormons, left, part, back, he just kept going back and back and back. I don't think he died a Mormon. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But, yeah, he was... Um, he also told his wife 
the Mormons won't, they don't agree with this, so I didn't add it, but his wife overheard him saying, you know, if you just leave me alone, I'm going to make a lot of money out of this. That was Martin Harris. Uh, Oliver Cowdery. So when Joseph, just a little too, a little quick history about this, he says he finds these plates. He needs a translator. The first guy is Martin Harris. Now, Martin Harris, they spend four months or whatever translating, and then Martin Harris accidentally loses them. Really, his wife Lucy took them and said, hey, if he's legit, have him do it again, and then he'll do it correctly this time, and then we can match him up and then say, oh, look, it's, it's actually true. Well, he went back, and Joseph went, uh, I, I, I can't, sorry. You know what? I have to do it from a different plate this time. Because it was, there was no plate originally. It was it was uh, Lehi. And then he's like, okay, well, Lehi's out because God's angry. Now it's Nephi. So he waits a year and then gets uh, Oliver Cowdery here to do another translation, except not from the book of Lehi, but of Nephi. Uh, because he, but So it's the same story, but just a little different. I mean, really? And he has another year. Now Mormons will say, wow, look, it's he only took three months to translate these plates. It's like... No, he had a year and four months, and actually, well, longer than that, like, to translate the whole thing. Like, this is, <laughs> like, and not to mention the revisions that went after that, too. What so, are they using to translate? Right, yeah, and so it's, they'll be, imp they say, oh, it's very impressive that he could translate 128 pages or whatever in three months. Like, it's actually not. It was over a year, and I've written a 200-page book in, like, two months. So it's not really, it's not that impressive. Um yeah, it's really, really not. If you have a story in your head. Um, so anyway, Oliver Cowdery, what did he say? Not to read the whole thing, but he said um, in an interview, did you touch them? His answer, we did not touch nor handle the plates. Even though, if we had read the beginning about the Witness of the Eleven, he would have said we touched and handled them. So he's automatically saying that we did. Um, of course, we were in the spirit when we had the view. No man could behold the face of an angel except in spiritual view. And uh, called it uh, being in vision. Uh, I know. Uh, Wait, how no man can behold the face of an angel expecting spirits. Well, that's weird because Joseph just did. It's almost like he's contradicting himself. That's so strange. Well, but he's less than a man, right? Because he's been divine. Well, well, who, Joseph? Yeah. Pretty much at this point, even though he was, they say he's a man because we're all men, right? Um, but, yeah, they hold him in such a high regard. I guess Joseph could have, right? He's, he's not just a man. He's just a man. He's yeah. He's just that awesome, so... He yeah. Seated from that regard. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, yeah, I'm just gonna cut all these guys out. And yeah, most of these guys were kicked out of the church. Most, all of them recanted their testimonies. But yet, it's still in the Book of Mormon to say, "Oh no, this was actually a witness thing." Uh, Why did they get extra custody? Yeah. Oh, because he, uh, they were kicked out of the church. Double crosses mean they were, they were kicked out. Um, David Whitmer, especially, is very vocal about his distaste for the church. And the prophet test. Let's see if Joseph was actually a prophet. So, Deuteronomy 18, by the way, memorize this verse in apologetics. This is huge for all kinds of groups, especially when people claim to be a prophet. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or not come true, this is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. You want to test if a guy is real? Only I know the future. If this was God speaking. So, if he tells you the future correctly... I told him, confirmed, yay. If he tells you something and it doesn't come to pass, kick him out. Kill him because he is a liar. He is trying to mislead you. He is evil. Get rid of this guy. That's not what I said. When I, when I say something happens, it happens because I'm sovereign and I'm God. Hold on. but I, this, this makes me feel a little bit weird because this is like a classic sort of like Ponzi scheme style um, scenario. Like if the, the classic example that I've heard of this is like you have let's say you were to send a scan email to like a thousand companies and each of them you were to tell the stock market was going to increase or decrease mm. in a specific month and 500 of them you said it would increase and 500 of them you said it would decrease right and you're correct for half of them and so you keep that half and you ignore the other half and then you tell them it's going to increase the next month or decrease the next month right you cut your pool in half again so you do that over and over and over again and eventually you end up with 25 people that you've correctly Yes, yeah, the he correctly market, guessed you. Yeah, uh, you know, ten or fifteen times in a row, and you know, they they might think, oh, you're really onto something, but in reality, it's it's simply you know a, a form of confirmation bias. Doesn't this hold about as much water as that? Like, if well, I were to way. say, oh, 
Uh, well, if it happens, then I were to speak it. That that seems like a self self confirming prophecy. In a way, because like if if it were me personally, and if a prophet comes up and goes, "Hey, I can tell the future," like I give him ninety five percent. Like if he's right ninety five percent of the time, it's like heck yeah, like you're the man. Like this guy knows everything. However. Like, okay, he's wrong on that. Maybe I misheard him. Maybe he misspoke. What, you know, but God makes a rule that says he may have speaks one time. And so you know, I guess in the, that's a good analogy, but it's like now run that same thing again over that 25 people and then run it again and run it again. And so it's not just one prophecy you're looking at. It's like, are you consistently prophesying again and again and again that this is going to happen? You have to be right 100% of the time because that's calling out the whole, hey, you might get one right, but, but let's not kid ourselves. The prophet's going to go, if he's false, hey, I got it right. I'm yeah. just going to do this again. Well, like, yeah, I, guess, you know I what I mean? Like, when it comes to that, yeah. though, is that you have to have a very large sample set of prophecies. For example, and you'd have the guy to just comes along too, yeah. and makes five prophecies, and he's right on all five times. That's not, like, enough to actually hold sort of Bayesian theorem. No. Sort of, you know, uh, grounds for, for assuming that what he's going to say next is correct, you know, depending on, you know, what your beginning parameters are. But... Um, so you need a lot of prophets. You would need a lot, yeah. And the prophets so back then, they had. To use it as a metric. Well, in a way, I mean, it's it's good to say because a lot of people are going to be wrong. It's almost like cold reading and stuff. It's like, have you ever seen that stuff with this guy named John Edwards who go up there and go, oh, "I'm feeling it's your um, you you have someone in your life. Name starts with M. Oh, mother, mother, of course." And he does this whole thing about I'm talking to your dead relative, and he's and it, it, it's a bunch of garbage, but he's able to get people to say stuff. Um, and people have been doing this for centuries. Like, people know how to trick people. But there's also that, I've seen him go over there and butcher them, and goes, and it's wrong. It's like, well, you just outed yourself. Now, you definitely are not hearing anybody because you were wrong. So that Bible's kind of giving us a thing like, like, this is the test. Like, they have to be 100%, because they're not going to make one. They're going to make multiple. We have every single prophet in the Bible to make multiple prophecies to kind of confirm themselves. And there's also, you know, miracles apparently involved and whatnot. But, go ahead, question. Oh, just kind of comment like that it would be very easy to do that. Let's say you get five in a row that are all successful each time you claim the gender of a baby or something without knowing it. And then if you, you know, claim something again, you say it's going to rain five, that's not going to make sense, sorry, inches, mm. five inches of rain tomorrow and it rains ten. They can't go, well, I was right about those other five prophecies I've done. So... So I messed up once, that's okay. You know, like, no one made a prophecy. Yeah. It didn't come true. You could have been guessing or making up what you previously had guessed. You don't right. want to just assume based on, like, past things they said. Yeah, and it's, being that charismatic, you're not going to make one prophecy, oh, it came true, and then not go for another one. Like, the t type of personality that says I'm a false prophet is going to be, I'm making multiple, multiple, and getting more and more followers down the line. So that's the why I think it gives us that you better be 100% right, and if you mess up once, that guy's not that guy's not a prophet. So I do think it gives us a pretty good view of like ah hit and miss. It's like no 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 one miss he's out, um, and that's really really hard to do by by just luck if you're making dozens of prophecies. So one you know it's and while all the groups we're going to show like there's prophecies made by people and none of them come true. So it's just another way to God go. You don't have to look at them like false prophet. He he didn't get it right. You know. Out he goes. Like, don't, don't even look at it. I have a question, but, hmm? but don't some say you have to wait a long time for prophecies to come true? Well, in the Bible, it's two types. You have prophecy that would happen within their lifetime, within like a year, five years, ten years, down the down the line, and then stuff that wasn't happen that was messianic. That's like, it's going to be about Jesus, like this has a bigger fulfillment, or this is strictly, hey, there's going to be a guy born in Galilee who's going to go here, he's going to preach this, there's going to be a murder here, that get all that right. So there is stuff that was confirming them at that, that point, or it's like after the fact. They would have a guy say, hey, I'm a prophet, dies, and then they look at his writings and years later and go, oh, we did get attacked by those people. This guy was correct. Oh, well, I guess we should have listened to him back then. So there is that too, but um, I, I can't, you know, the uh, one prophet's escaping me that happened to him. It's not, not Jeremiah. Jeremiah is awesome. Um, but anyway, there is some of that, but most of the way, there's that two type is the, the quick and then the extended. It's you, That's why they can confirm themselves and there's you know miracles involved to confirm themselves as well but um as far as a prophecy is concerned yeah and then it's a not uh, that's like you said some of the charismatic some of the people who are claiming themselves to be modern day prophets right now it's you know a lot of stuff is that it's going to be immediate mm. and you'll know within a certain amount of time 
I've seen, you know, just throwing that out there, like this past election. You had people. Oh, yeah. Trump, Trump, is Trump is going to win, and this is going to happen. The world's like, in there, yeah. Oh, not profit. And yep. so, and then when that happened, people were in denial. Yeah. Because they believed this guy, so they. So people, you know, are trying to change the narrative that, oh, he's going to get back in office instead of, like, he's going to be president in this. this Does everyone thing. remember Harold Camping from, oh, how long ago was that? Um, he said the end of the world was going to happen. It was around 2000, uh, maybe 8, 2000. He said it true. Yeah. A couple of times. Yeah, he said yeah, it a couple of times. His last true. big one, I was in New York then, and there was people with signs going around. They're like, the end is coming. And called some Christians out there with their Bibles like, no, you're wrong. And, all belongings. Yeah, but he said, I made a prophecy, this is it. And yeah, they sold all their belongings, they got they bought vans, they're going around. And then I remember sitting in an Orioles game, and these kids right sitting next to me were going, three, two, one, yay! Because it was that was the moment of the end of the world. Of course, I'm there watching a baseball game. It's like, oh, oh, okay, you got a hit. I guess that that's not the end of the world after all. Like, I, I just think that's funny. The yeah, Harold Campy has now been out, out. I mean, he should have been outed a long time ago because he already he messed up earlier. Like, he's he's done. Like, read Deuteronomy. It says your prophet. He claims he's being a prophet. He's wrong. He's out. And it, um, it, it also kind of exposes the heart of that particular prophet. Yes. What is he doing it for? Right. He's leaving because he wants followers, and that's what Joseph got, um, and that's where we're going to head. So, um, President Smith, because he's president of that. Joe, he ran for president too. Anyway, um, didn't win. President Smith then stated the meeting had been called because God had commanded it, and it was made known to him by a vision and by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is telling him, and go forth and prune the vineyard the last time for the coming of the Lord, which is nigh 56 years, should wind up the scene. Uh, this was written in 1843, 1844. So uh, let's do the math real quick. Nope. See, there we have prophecy. Holy Spirit said to me, God is confirming that at the end will happen in 56 years. No, it didn't. I can now, you know, retroactively say, no, he was not a prophet. I do not need to be afraid of him. The one with the Mormons that said he was this uh, Mistranslation. Uh, well, he didn't really mean 56. Like, he doesn't really mean this generation. He means that generation while meaning this generation. That's Becky. What? That's Becky. That's well, no, that's the, just that's the same thing, though. Yeah. In all I know. fairness, uh, <laughs> we, we, I mean, Jesus spoke much more vaguely he simply said it was soon but even to the early church they sort of thought soon was soon in sort of their time yeah oh yeah they so did. they sort of we sort of had to take it sort of as like a mistranslation as well when it came to the world not ending you know <laughs> soon in human years um, well yeah you take like hey the, this is this the, the is this is the end like we mean end as in like the end of the jew right and so it starts to open up but this is right <laughs> so 56 specific years. 56 years uh, and the big one here uh, he said, even the place of the temple, which the temple shall be reared in this generation. So he's very keen on this. Very fully, this generation shall not pass away. He's taking it from Matthew 24. Until a house shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it. God's going to actually come down. Which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation upon a consecrated spot that I have appointed? I this is the spot that he appointed. 100% confirmed. There's a little, see his little house over here. Okay. This is the place that he that he said a giant temple, LDS temple, will be built there. Now you might say, well, there's a temple here. No, oh, not the LDS. That's a different one. The, all the different Mormon doc, the Norman sects bought up property as much as they could, but the temple lot itself is empty. Still to this day, if you can go on Google Earth, drop a guy, and it is nothing but a field. It's far too small to have a temple be built on top of it. They've thought about it. They've tried, and they're like, well, this thing would just be... <clears throat> to, to, it doesn't, doesn't work. It can't work. So it's almost God kind of going, <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out so well. Also, I, he said just this generation, repeat himself, this, 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 it's going to happen now. Didn't happen. Um, funny enough, all the other ones tried. They got close, but not close enough. So, no, Joseph, you were wrong on that. There's a couple more false prophecies from Joseph, but we won't be here all night. Um, okay, so how do you witness to a Mormon? They come to your door. Well... Uh, as one of his famous ones, the King Follett Discourse, he said, God himself was once a man as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form like yourselves. In all the person's images and very, uh, very form, uh, form as a man. Sorry. It is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. 
We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and I will take away and take away the veil so that you may see. See what? See that God was once a man and through exaltation became a God of his own planet. And as he said, as man is now, God once was. And as God is now, man may be. You will become God. You will become equal with God. Isn't that the temptation that Adam and Eve... Isn't that... That's, that's so weird that... Oh, no, no, I can't be... Um, and more from Joseph. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all of eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so you may see. So just the same thing, like I said. From all of eternity, he was not God. He was once a man. And he was once created. He had a beginning. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. Isaiah 43.10 is going to be our main verse. You are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe that and understand that I am he, ego me, before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I am God, there is only one God. Another one in Isaiah 45, he says, Is there another God? I know not one. Yet according to Joseph, there are infinite amount of gods. There are gods upon gods. God once had a god. God has brothers that are gods. God has, he's just, there's gods everywhere. Not to mention there's female gods. There's, he's up and he has multiple goddess wives. So is that, what difference is that from Hinduism? Oh, yeah, exactly. So, but not to mention, we, becoming a Mormon through, through works and exaltation, will become a god one day. Well, wait, that means God's transforming you into a god. Yes. Nor shall there be any god formed after me. No other gods. One God. Great Mormons have no response to this verse. They say, well, it's, he was talking about, like, no, God's making a statement about himself, about his nature. He, he's, he's being clear that that's just me. There is no more God. It's me. It's always been me. And if you go to, yeah, 44.8, um, you're saying there's no, there was God, no God besides me. Is there any other rock? I know of none. So God does not even know of any other gods. But if there was this infinite amount of God, you would think God would say, well, I know some of them. I know Goddess Mother or, or you know, Lucifer. Like, no, I don't even know of any of them. They don't exist. It's been me. It's always been me. And there will never be another one. An interesting analog to this is that, like, you know, when you, when you have the Ten Commandments, you know, right at the top is, <laughs> you shall not have any other God before me. So it's interesting. He doesn't just say, you shall not have any other God altogether. He simply says, you shall not have any other God before me. So, so he sort of allows at that point in time, which was earlier than Isaiah, sort of the concept of there being another God, which I think speaks to sort of Judaism's polytheistic roots. Um, for example, you can see like when, <laughs> when Moses leaves them just for like by themselves for just a little while. Oh yeah, what do they, they mean? Like, yeah, uh -huh. So th there's a very inherent sort of polytheistic mindset in, in the Jews at that point in yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. That God sort of allows in the, sort of the Ten Commandments, but by the time of Isaiah, we see that. Yeah. That it's it's been re drilled down like yeah, God's really <laughs> revealing more of itself. Right. That, that's a great point of saying like like how many times do I have to tell you guys like this is it. There is no more. It's me and it's me alone. Um, and what a great one to use on Mormons. Before the mountains were brought forth, uh, before they were formed, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Yeah. From eternity, Elohim, uh, Te Elohim in Hebrew, always as far back as you can infinitely go to as far ahead as you can infinitely go. I am God. There is no other one. So, Mormons don't believe this. They well, believe that God once had a beginning. And um, like Jezebel versus Elijah, when um, doing the temple, like you know, God's just like, oh, bring it, like let them show off. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> so it, it's it's such it, Mormons need to get this. Like you have Joseph coming along. I mean, Isaiah's written in you know, six hundred. What, what anyway? Whenever it's written. You go that far into the future and go, wait, God's revealed this about himself here. Joseph comes along in 1800 and says, oh, actually, he's wrong. Like, who, who am I, whose word am I taking here? Like, we have scrolls of Isaiah, the great Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know that is in there, like 100%. And you're telling me, yes, is that canon? Yes. Does anyone recognize that as scripture? Yes. But you just printed out something that said contrary to that. Yes. Who are we supposed to believe? The original or the one that guy said, the guy saying, no, 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 he's actually wrong. Like, no, I'm going to take God's word for it, not the word of Joseph Smith. Uh, not especially when he has nothing else to back it up with and nothing's going to contradict scripture. So, yes, that's our big verse. Remember Isaiah 43.10, talking to Mormons, because it's such a good, you, I have no response to this. You need to figure out the true nature of God, because the God that Joseph revealed to you is not God. 
And if we went back to Deuteronomy 18, if you read a couple of verses before that, it says if, you, if even someone leads you after a different kind of God, don't follow them. Like, no, it's me, I'm God. And that's what Joseph is doing. It's saying, no, 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 this God is like kind of God. Doesn't really have, ha has a beginning. He's like you and you can become just like him one day. Uh, I swear if Joseph wasn't killed, there would be no Mormons today. Because he would have gotten so insanely crazy as he kept going on. Because none of this, what he was saying here, if I go back, wait, where is it? None of this is in the Book of Mormon. Like, the Book of Mormon actually disagrees with him, yet he wrote the Book of Mormon. That's because this is later in his life. This is 20 years after the Mormon book. So he, it's, he just starts getting more and more bizarre as he's going along, more power hungry, more crazy about his ideas. If he hadn't been killed, eventually he would have said he was an alien. I mean, well, what it's. What is the opinion of the Church of Latter day Saints on the Internal Discourses? Do they believe it to be. Oh, scripture. They believe it's oh, yeah. Like, uh, everything, Brigham and Joseph, everything that they wrote is considered absolute scripture. Yes, without a doubt. Um, they even said that what we write is equal to scripture. So they've kind of sank themselves on that, especially when they agree with, uh, you know, polygamy, saying you need to have, you need to be polygamous, otherwise you're going to go to hell. Uh, yeah, Mormons don't do polygamy anymore, except for the fundamentalists, <laughs> uh, which is from that next split show. I We've only seen that one episode. Um, yes, keep sweet and no, I pray and obey. The, uh, but they said in their writings like oh yeah if you don't you know polygamous you're going to hell it's like but god changed his mind in 1910 like well yeah like but you said that was scripture uh-huh like you're contradicting yourself is it is it scripture is it not it's just constantly moving forward anyway um things i didn't get into um the scientific and historical inconsistencies in the book of mormon uh places that ex don't exist uh dna that's not found in the in the indians that they were not jews uh, things like money, things like steel, all kinds of other stuff that's just not there. Uh, blatant racism in the church. Joseph was absolutely a racist. I didn't want to get into a lot of that, but he has some really terrible things to say. And the church changed their mind in 1970s about you know, black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to get into that. Um, a little bit on polygamy, but yeah, I, I could have gone deeper. Uh, plagiarism. So a lot of the books that were that children were reading in the early 1800s are somehow magically just like the Book of Mormon. It's almost like he had those concepts and then brought them in. Um, the secession crisis, I went over a little bit about people saying, oh, we want to go with Brigham, we want to go with, St with Strange. Even Strange said he found plates. Like you have another one of these guys that goes, well, I found plates too. Um, Brigham Young's inconsistent, yeah, scripture sermons, that's, that's a, I could do an hour on that. And then how they treat women, not exactly great. They've gotten better in the past 20 or so years but um, not so great on their treatment of women. Uh, but all of this, the average Mormon today probably doesn't know, at least on the, in this generation, because they're very, they've been trying to move away from all these bizarre toxic roots and just kind of be like, look, we're Christians. Joseph Smith was a prophet, but we're Christians. We're just like everyone else. We love Jesus. We love the resurrection. We love all of this. But the average Mormon in their 20s doesn't know any of this. And he, as James White said, you almost have to, convert them to Mormonism to actually get them back out of it because they have such a very bland, open, liberal view of their own religion that they don't even know what they believe. Now, the old timers, they'll believe all this. But today's, they've really tried to push them away and say, I will forget all that stuff in the middle there, the hat reading, and that's, that's fine. So it's you either get full swing of, I fully commit to the hat and everything, the seer stones, or wait, what? There was a hat and seer stones? It's, it is especially now the culture is kind of shifting. So that's where we are with Mormons today. Um, next week, we'll go over the kingdom of God and Jehovah's Witnesses. And there we are. Uh, I'm going to kill the, uh, I'm going to say kill. I'm going to use such violent language. I'm sorry. I'm going to end the YouTube live. Everyone who watched, thank you for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go to our Zoom meeting. And next week, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, people in the group, I will catch you on Zoom in just a matter of minutes. Thank you very much, everyone.